Hello, Assalamu Alaikum, and welcome to the 10th session of LUMS Live. And the idea for this initiative is to get the dialogue going, to get experts from different areas, different fields, and throw difficult questions at them and try and have some answers. Today, we have a very important topic. But before that, if you've missed out on any of our previous sessions, uh, look them up on Facebook or YouTube. We've had some fantastic conversations. Uh, today's session and today's topic is how academic research changed as a result of COVID-19. What is academic research? We want to know that. Um, and how has it been affected by COVID-19? Uh, we have a very highly qualified panel again today. As always, we have Dr. Eduardo Sandoval, who's a Scientia Fellow and Associate Lecturer, Faculty of Arts and Design, University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia. Dr. Eduardo, welcome and thank you for your time. We have Dr. Umar Mubin. Dr. Umar is a senior lecturer, School of Computer, Data, and Mathematical Sciences, Western Sydney University, Australia. Dr. Umar, thank you for your time and thank you for joining us. We have Dr. Mariam Mustafa. Dr. Mariam is the assistant professor, Department of Computer Science, Sayed Babarli School of Science and Engineering, LUMS. Thank you for coming and thank you for taking your time, Dr. Mariam. And we have Dr. Sabi Anwar once again. And Dr. Sabi is the dean of the same school that Mariam is associated with, Sayyid Babali School of Science and Engineering, LUMS. So thank you so much, all of you, for making time. Um, if I can start with Dr. Sabi. Dr. Sabi, before we go into you know, what's happening um, in research, LUMS was predominantly known as a university where students do MBA and BBA. But over the years, you know, it, it's broadened a lot. And there's significant research going on in LUMS. So give us a brief overview. What kind of research takes place at LUMS? Um, thank you very much, Adil. And good afternoon to you, to all the viewers. Uh, it could be good morning, good night, good evening for some of our viewers. But uh, So research, as you know, is chasing the unknown or synthesizing different kinds of knowledge and putting a new picture in front of you. All of this happens at LUMS. We chase the unknown. We are chasers or hunter gatherers for new ideas. We look for the truth. So now LUMS has over the years grown into a research university. So we discover, we invent, we innovate, we look for new ideas, we sharpen those ideas, and then we communicate those ideas to the world at large. This is what research means. And as a result of research, you write papers, you write uh, journal articles, you publish books, you produce new modes of learning, you write newspaper articles. So there's, there's a lot of output from research that comes out and LUMS does all that. So we have these five schools in our uh, university, we have humanities, business, law, education, and of course, science and engineering. So there's disciplinary research that goes in, in, into these schools. People work on different research ideas, they write grants, they work with their students, and they produce one of the outcomes of research. It could be a book, a paper, a, a new idea, even a new documentary, a new film, or sometimes even a new poem. That's what research is all about. In the School of Science and Engineering to which I belong, I would like to categorize research into three broad classes. And each one of them is impacted differently in this COVID scenario. So, and the distinction between these three categories is not very sharp, uh, but for the sake of discussion, we have analytical or theoretical research. So there's a cosmologist in the physics department who discovers how the universe was formed, what is the structure of the universe? And he can keep on thinking this COVID scenario. He can keep on engaging with students. He doesn't need to come to work. The second kind of research is computational. So you need a computer, you need silicon in front of you. When you work on computers, you work with data, you do data crunching, you write algorithms, you write programs, new data, and that cycle is furnished over and over again. So work can be computational. And of course, computational work can also be spread out uh, into homes, into, it need not happen at LUMS. The third kind of research, which is actually suffering the most or is impacted the most is experimental research in which uh, a biochemist is wearing a lab coat and is working in a fume hood inside a biology laboratory and 
mixing portions together and a new explosion occurs and a new reaction occurs. So this kind of experimental research is also done at LAMS. And I think this is the research that is being impacted the most, which means it's being affected the most. People can't come to the laboratories. They cannot work inside the laboratories. So these are the three streams of research that happen at LAMS. And each one has its own texture, its own flavor, and each one of them is being affected differently. That's a lot. I, I, you know, I should have studied science and not arts when I was younger, but then Lums wasn't there when I was younger, much younger. Dr. Eduardo, uh, your, you know, your area of expertise or interest is social robotics and human robot interaction. Tell us briefly what that is, and also tell us, is it really possible for robots or machines to have a meaningful interaction with humans? Is it really possible? Uh, you may want to unmute the mic, uh, Dr. Eduardo. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. we can. Yeah. Well, okay. thank you so much for the invitation, and thank you so much for your question. Well, human-robot interaction is the multidisciplinary study of the methods, techniques, and implementations, also uh, technical developments of machines, which have uh, the properties of uh, uh, resemble human features in terms of behavior and appearance. And we aim to try to generate a natural interaction um, with humans different kind of interaction that we have with the current devices that we use with touch screens, keyboards, mouses, and uh, monitors in front of us. So it's a very novel area of research. Uh, the first meeting of people specialized in this area was in the late 90s in Japan uh, with the Roman conference. And social robots is an um, umbrella term that englobes uh, many other aspects of this kind of research, um, um, call it HRI or human robot interaction. Human robot interaction usually uh, describes the experimental work done face to face or one to one uh, between one user and one robot in experimental conditions in uh, lab rooms. Social robotics is, um, uh, as I said before, an umbrella term that describes the social aspect, the ethical aspects, the moral aspects of these future relationships. At the moment, the technology in this area is um, still a lot of work in progress. Most of the robots that you can see with social capabilities and anthropomorphic and human-like uh, embodiments are pretty much research robots. Some companies are doing the first steps towards commercial robots. So recently I experienced in Korea a um, robot that was able to direct the customers towards the stores inside of the airport. You can see also in Japan, um, SoftBank stores, uh, this huge telecommunications uh, corporative company, trying to interact in natural way with the users. Um, of course, the uh, technology still has limitations, but um, as a main goal, yes, uh, I could say that uh, most of us, we aim to engage in a meaningful way with, with um, the users. However, there are a lot of considerations, uh, considering that meaningful means many things at the same time. Uh, I, I will say that is a fascinating area of a study. I consider that uh, there is a space for many specialities, um, a part of computer science, uh, roboticists, uh, engineers. Um, more recently, we have noticed that people working in anthropology, sociology, design, arts, media arts, um, uh, have interest in this area. Uh, so it's nurturing of all these disciplines. Uh, so I will encourage our, our younger uh, researchers or, or younger undergrads who are looking for areas of opportunity to have a look to what we do in human-robot interaction and maybe they are the generation that will make possible the real meaningful engagement with users. Wow, that's, that's very fascinating. Uh, Dr. Umar, uh, your primary research interests are also human-robot interaction. Uh, if you want to add something to what Dr. Eduardo said, but I want to know how has COVID-19 affected your area or the research that's going on in your area? Um, yeah, so thank you. Thanks again, Adil, and thanks for having me in regards to everybody. Um, I think Eduardo has summarized the field of human-robot interaction very well. Um, 
Um, so together we've, we've done some work together as well, specifically what I'm looking into just more into the application of social robotics in specific scenarios. So I've looked into how robots can be used in public spaces as, as a concierge, as, as you know, in, in the library and so on. So just to give a very quick example, we can't do research in the field anymore with the robots. So if we wanted to do a study in the university, it wouldn't be possible. Um, just talking about generally about the impact of the pandemic on research activities, unfortunately, it has negative aspects. Um, and the negative aspects are in the short term. There are some positive aspects which would be in the long term, but just for the moment, I'd like to focus on the negative aspects. Um, I, I, I guess the first big biggest hit that we had was working from home. So you might think, okay, you're working from home, productivity may go up, but it may not be the case for everybody. Uh, uh, you know, some academics or some researchers might have uh, career responsibilities. They, you know, we've had to homeschool our kids. Uh, and, you know, they might, we, uh, some of us might be in some sort of, uh, you know, uh, in a mental state, which is not very uh, positive because of the situation. Uh, this may mean that productivity could go down. So that's sort of just, just starting off with the working from home. And as, as uh, Dr. Savi said, uh, you know, having, not having access to labs, uh, data collection is, a, is, a, is problematic. Um, um, besides that, uh, you know, projects have need to be rescoped. So because of these issues and these sort of predicaments that everybody's facing, uh, we need to come up with new timelines for our projects. Uh, we cannot finish projects uh, when they were, you know, what we had thought they, uh, they would finish. So we need to sort of rescope, uh, you know, uh, make contingency plans, uh, come up with new timelines, like I said. Um, and yeah, and like I said, the collection of data face to face is not possible. We have to move to online data collection. That changes the whole scope of the project, the research questions, uh, the research aims of the project cha uh, change. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I guess the other thing that we need to look on is the, the, the hit that's the pandemic or, 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 or COVID-19 has had on the economy. So uh, universities are not, have not been spared, at least in Australia, they haven't been spared from this economic recession. Uh, and that means uh, we need to think about what happens to funding, what uh, will funding agencies be able to honor funding uh, contracts? Will there be funding available in the future? How easy will it be to get? Um, and, and so on. So this is sort of the, unfortunately, the, the short term impact has been negative. Uh, there are some positive impa impacts as well, which uh, maybe we, we can touch upon in the, in the later part of this conversation. Yeah. Sure, we do that. Dr. Mariam, uh, Dr. Mubin mentioned a uh, problem with data collection multiple times. Um, in your department or your school, um, how do you collect data and, and what's happened ever since this pandemic has taken place? What's happened to data collection? Is it, is it still difficult? Is it impossible? Is it more online? Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, you might want to unmute the mic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Adil, and uh, salam alaikum to everyone. So within the CS department, my particular uh, lab and my work uh, is around human computer interaction, which is the big umbrella. Um, and I specifically work on developing technologies within developing contexts, right? How do you create technologies for poor countries? How do you create technologies, particularly within the Pakistani context? And a lot of our work actually, because we're developing technologies for end users, so they're part of the design process, they're part of our initial field work. A lot of our work in the earlier uh, phases depends on meeting these people where they are, in their homes, in their workplaces, having conversations, sort of recording not just their interviews, but their work environments, what their daily schedules look like. And based on that, we develop the technologies that will fit best for their context, right? So the goal is to develop technologies that work for them, given their resources, their scheduling, what their house situation looks like, and factoring in all of this. So for, for our work, field work has effectively stopped for two months, right? Which means all of the projects, I'm teaching a course that is project-based. It is a course on development and there are 13 projects in that. All of them had to be reworked because you know my kids no longer have access to the field. Um, and so we have to work around these constraints. Um, thankfully for a lot of the projects, we have enough ground data and we've been working within the Pakistani context for long enough. So we understand the basic sort of model 
for different communities. And you know, more often than not, we work with uh, community level organizations uh, that have reach within the community, that have a trust within the community. They've been working within these communities, building up capacity for organizations like Ahuvat or RISC, right? That work that have very strong connections in communities, and they already have a great deal of data that we can sort of leverage and move forward. But effectively, if you're, if you're, if any of your work was with communities, so if you were designing technologies within different communities for different users, whether it was having users come into the lab or you going into the field, that's effectively stopped. Now, within the Western context, so my colleagues in the US and in Europe within Western context, they've already put together a framework for doing this um, online. So they've sort of digitized ethnographies and online interviews, and they're using tools like having diaries and having users take pictures or videos, having users communicate over Zoom. Our challenge, and it's a big challenge, is that the populations we deal with are not digitally literate. They don't have access, they don't have internet, they don't have a phone, and when they do, we can't reach them. These are not tools they're comfortable with, which means we really have to think outside the box and start to get really creative because this is not a short-term thing. So this is something we can work around for two or three months, but any longer than that, we would really have to um, think about how do we get access to our core user base? How do you design tech for these users where they're not digitally literate, they don't have an online presence? Dr. Sabi, I'm going to ask you a really basic question at the risk of having my head chopped off or trolled off these days. People you know, get trolled these days, which is how important really is academic research you know, one thinks there are people uh, who say so many resources go into doing research, which is much of it is kind of useless. You know, it gets printed somewhere. There's an article in the journal and nobody hears of it anymore. Um, I want your opinion on how important it is and has it evolved over the years or has academic research been kind of the same, you know, year after year? Research is an organic process. It evolves. Uh, with time. So if you look at the history of science and technology, right from the Babylonian times to the 21st century, research has evolved. It's a, like a chameleon. It keeps on changing its color all the time. Now, uh, there, were, there were the Greek times when one used to do experiments in the mind. Then there was a time when technology developed, gadgetry came into existence, and then real experiments started. And then you produce tools to do experiments. You produce microscopes, you produce telescopes. So it's a very organic and a very fluid enterprise. And research, by the way, is uh, just consider the COVID pandemic. Without fundamental research in viruses, you cannot develop vaccines. Without understanding how a virus behaves, what actually is a virus, what is RNA, what does the surface of a virus look like? How does the body react to it? This all looks like blue sky research, but without this blue sky research, you cannot actually develop a vaccine which can save millions of people, lives of millions of people. Smallpox was eradicated in 1979. Behind this eradication was a long story of illustrious research from a long list of bacteriologists and virologists. So research, might have short-term benefits and it might have long-term benefits. There are kinds of research that give you immediate output. The social robotics field, which my colleagues have mentioned, has evolved in the past 10 or 20 years, and now it's become ubiquitous. There are other kinds of research whose outcomes will appear in decades, and we have to be patient. So this is how research, the texture of research is different. It's but it's impactful. And then it's the innate human curiosity, which actually goes for the unknown, which shoots arrows into the dark. And without this curiosity, you, you cannot develop as a human race. And I research is at the pinnacle of this shoot in the dark. I'm gonna throw a question at you and Dr. Mariam. And if Dr. Mubin wants to answer a bit later is, uh, you know, in my opinion, Pakistan isn't a society where research is respected. So it'll be interesting to have your opinion on that in, in, in a bit. Uh, but I have a question for Dr. Eduardo. Um, tell us, Dr. Eduardo, given the restrictions on research accessibility these days, is there any 
project that that you're working on uh, that's that's affected um, on, and how do you think the timelines Dr. we mentioned the timelines of projects will be will be pushed forward how will the timelines be affected now that you know the world is shut down well um i i will split the the, the question in several chunks to to manage it to to answer it uh, f first thing i just want to comment about the response of um uh, Dr. Ampar, in terms that um, I, I agree in his views about what research is and the direct correlation between the infrastructure and the critical number of researchers to be ready for this kind of crisis in the future. I reckon countries with more uh, research infrastructure in all the areas will be more prepared to deal with these kind of things in the future. So I think it's important to let us to let know our governments or our uh, rule makers on um, the importance in the long term and in the mid term of of the activity that we perform. So, uh, in this sense, um, I see myself as well as an intellectual uh, adventurer, right? I, I don't want to see myself never as a person in front of the computer just typing, right? For me, it's an intellectual adventure. You know, it's that's why I left my home country and I tried to discover new horizons. And um, I think it's it's, it's the approach that. Um, um, it's suitable for keeping us motivated in the hard times. Um, on the other hand, we have the uh, hard reality, right? Um, we have the commitments with our colleagues inside of the uni. We have the commitments with our uh, external partners as industry partners. We have the commits with our partners uh, and, and other universities. And the thing is that I reckon researchers, we are, um, well prepared um, more than other industries for these kind of times in the sense that remote collaboration has been going around in our field for quite a few years. It is not perfect. It is not easy to perform, but it's already there. So now we have the opportunity to make it evolve, to make it uh, more efficient. Um, in the past, before the crisis, I was running um, multiple collaborations with colleagues in New Zealand, try to develop new collaborations with colleagues in Netherlands, uh, try to continue certain collaborations with um, my colleagues in Mexico, my, my home country. And um, I have now more reasons to keep them going, right? Um, the challenge is um, match the agendas of all of us. Uh, as uh, Dr. Uh, Moving mentioned before, my colleagues tend to have kids and they tend to have more than one kid. And of course the commitment uh, that they require to take care of them, uh, it's quite high, they are not robots. So they definitely require human attention and they require um, your time. And as a researcher, you are uh, fiercely father or mother. So probably your priority when you are at home, um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's your kids and your, and your domestic chores. And um, the other thing that we need to work is um, in the human limitations and the, um, the management of the routines and the management of projects, um, but also even the biological limitations that we have. I was recently um, discussing with some of my colleagues that there are some evidence apparently that being in multiple meetings during the day um, online, it's tiring, it's physically tiring because the quality of the sun is not like I have a face-to-face -face conversation and um, your eyes get tired after several hours in front of the monitor. So yeah, definitely projects ha are, are being affected, but I reckon as a community, we are more ready than others for facing this challenge. So uh, again, it's a continuation of how usually we are working. Um, research is a highly collaborative activity, probably one of the most human um, collaborative activities that you can see around uh, cannot be performed individually, isolated in, in the way that I understand research. So yeah, it's sometimes it's about set up the right environment for productivity and set up yourself the mood to keep productive. So we need to develop resilience. We need to develop um, will to wake up in the morning and stop to watch my mobile phone and put in front of my paper that I need to write, in front of the grant that I need to write, and keep moving, um, yeah, face these challenges. 
Dr. Umar, uh, Dr. Eduardo mentioned, you know, uh, his colleagues has uh, kids and not robots. Maybe in the future, we might want to have robots and not kids. Uh, we, 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 we don't know. You had mentioned uh, some good things coming out of, uh, you know, the, the, the COVID-19 uh, crisis in, in research. So we see that universities and teaching has changed, really. Has the research changed yet, or is it too early for research to kind of change so quickly to, to, to a crisis? Um, and if you mentioned the good things that you have mentioned, uh, yeah. we'd love to hear those. Yeah, so uh, I think like all, all, all of the panel members, they've touched, uh, they have touched upon. Um, I think the key thing about any, any scientist or any researcher is that they're quite adaptive. Um, and I feel that the community, the scientific community, the research community has, they have adapted quite quickly to this uh, pandemic, to, to COVID-19. Um, and I, this is something that Eduardo also touched upon. Uh, We're seeing a lot of international collaboration. So we have all, uh, basically COVID-19 hasn't spared anybody. It's every, every country is sort of facing the, like a really bad situation. Uh, what researchers have then done is that they have said, okay, we'll put whatever projects that we were doing before on the side. Let's get together and see what we can do to tackle this pandemic. So we have, suddenly we have a lot of research teams working together, uh, trying to come up with solutions. You know, maybe it could be a vaccine. It could be, you know, governmental interventions, policies, strat strategic interventions, modeling, uh, projections, and, and, and so on. Um so essentially what we're seeing is that, okay, we, we leave ourselves, we leave our individual interests on the side. Uh, we'll forget about writing our papers that we wanted to write before. We'll try to see, let's, can we do this relevant COVID-19 research that might help the community? So what we're seeing is something which is very critical for, and this is something which is quite close to myself as well, which is, which is the sort of uh, desire to do applied research. So it's not just, you're trying to see, is there something that I can do that can readily be applied in the real world uh, rather than, you know, writing an academic article where it meant like you, you touched upon as well, where it might not even be read. Um, so what's the impact of research? And this is something that a lot of people are trying to establish now is the impact of research, your age index or how many papers you have published and, and, and have had set, and have those cited, or is it the impact that your research has had on you know, government policy, uh, you know, the community, uh, you know, and so on. So just to summarize, we've seen the sharing of information, you know, medical staff getting together, hospitals getting together and trying to see if we can beat this pandemic. Um, what, what a trend that I'd like to mention is that what we're seeing is that uh, a lot of research in COVID-19 has been expedited. What this means is that normally when you submit an article to to a journal or to, uh, you know, to a peer reviewed uh, uh, source, it, it's a pretty sort of uh, elongated review process. It takes several months, could, it, it takes a long while for it to be peer reviewed. What peer reviewed means essentially is that the paper needs to be disseminated to external independent reviewers who, who basically read the paper and make a judgment on its quality and, and, and it's mainly its contribution. So that's, that's sort of the uh, I think uh, Dr. Sabi also mentioned this, that I, research needs to have that novelty, the contribution, what's the gap that you're addressing in the field. So what we're seeing with journals that are looking for COVID-19 articles is that they're offering this expedited review process. So you submit your paper to our journal and we'll try, and if it's COVID-19 related, we will try to expedite the review process and hopefully we have an answer for you. And I, I saw some research that journals are, uh, pushing out papers, 50 uh, COVID-19 papers, 50% uh, on average, uh, less duration as they would when uh, for their regular or non-COVID related uh, papers. So let's say if, if they would take six months to complete the review process, they're now only taking three months or less than three months. Which, but this is just an example. In reality, it's actually taking much, much less time. Uh, another trend that what we're seeing is that you can we, you can put your articles on as a preprint. What preprint means is that it's not peer reviewed and you can put it in public repositories where it's there for viewing, for reading and, and, and uh, for people to have a look at. Uh, but the challenge there is that we need to be careful about quality and quantity because those papers are not peer reviewed. And we've had instances or uh, isolated instance, instances of people being misled because those papers have given information which has not been peer reviewed 
or independently uh, you know verified by external reviewers so we just need to be careful about this sort of um, quality and quantity situation uh, but but generally what we're seeing is that uh, you know people have adapted and they're trying to really push out uh, research on covid-19 collaborating with each other sharing information and so on so forth dr mariam um, i'm going to you know would like to have your opinion on what i asked earlier it seems that there's not enough culture in pakistan for research we don't take research too seriously culturally not in, in one university so that's so what are your thoughts on that but i'm going to pair it with another question uh, that dr mumin also mentioned research requires funding and grants especially in universities and colleges do you think um, you know in the last 8 weeks or so there's, there's been a problem with funding where ongoing research is, is taking place I'm going to answer your second question first because it's slightly easier. <laughs> I'm going to your first question, which is more layered. Um, I think, as far as research and funding is concerned, it's it's too early to tell where it's going. But what's currently been happening is that you know when I speak to colleagues in the U.S., I've spoken to some colleagues in Australia. Universities have sort of shut down on all sort of um, extra funding, right? So they've they've frozen startup grants. uh some universities uh, faculty has voluntarily uh, sort of reduced their salaries right um you still have you know but in the in the in the same vein the funding agencies that have already given out grants they're being very flexible right so they're saying okay you can take a 12 month extension on this grant that you already have because we understand that maybe your project is it, you know in given the current situation you might not be able to meet your milestones right the other thing that they've done that some of them have done and this is really fantastic and i think it would it's such a um there there's so much scope for opportunity here where you know some funding agencies have said that if you would like to change the grant that you already have if you want to change the direction a little bit so that you are now you are now attacking a covid related problem we're going to allow you to do that right so that's great because now you can actually make your work a little bit more relevant in terms of what's happening currently there is still a lot of funding coming out there are a lot of grants being put out and but most of these now are covid related they're not all in the um, the medical sciences they're not directly related to figuring out a solution to the virus quite a few of them are related to digital solutions right because and i have some numbers here 54% of the global population is not can only 54% of the global global population in the world is connected right so that's like half pe- half the people in the world are no longer they're not online they're not connected right so given the 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 and this is like one third of households in new york city don't have a broadband connection at home right which means that this is not just a developing world problem anymore this is a global problem so now a lot of the grants that you are seeing and really big grants like ibm just put out a 270000 dollar grant for um, digital response to covid right which includes crisis communication remote learning and community cooperation because now all of these things have to go online but we're not really prepared for it uh, given that half the world's population isn't even online right and so there you there's a lot of funding coming in that's targeting um sort of covid related problems but not directly health related problems right how do you get people online how do you create learning platforms that work for everybody how do you create uh, e health platforms that work for everybody so how do you how do you create shopping platforms that work for everybody so a lot of funding in that vein now long term this means that you know other areas i mean i was reading a report that talked about how there are there are some longitudinal studies 50 years 30 years right so they're they're in sort of um, oceans or forests or islands they're monitoring certain um, animals or uh, natural fauna and those those researchers have been pulled back so those studies are suffering right so there is this strange imbalance but in the long run there is almost certainly going to be a cutting down of uh, funding for research that's i mean that's coming and i think we should all prepare for that right state a lot of the funding that for research that's get put into research comes from state um and as we go into this economic depression that is invariably going to be affected now about your first question i think i mean in my own first i can only speak to my own personal experience of doing research in pakistan for two years right um i think if you if i found that there is a certain respect because we work with the community so we interview people we talk to people we give them a sense of what we're doing and what we would like to design for them i think there is a great deal of respect for what you're doing if there is an understanding of what you're doing right so i think what what happens often and there are quite a few researchers who've talked about this 
is that when we go into the field and we have, we are mining these people for their data, and then we go into our universities and we write these complicated research papers that go into conferences and journals, but they never make it to the population from whom we got the data, right? So this, this is never translated into anything meaningful for them. So they have zero understanding of what we're doing and why we did it, right? So there is an ethical dilemma as well there because really you are using these people to sort of uh, promote your own career, you know, based on these research articles that we write, these grants we get, we get tenure, we get promoted, we make more money, all of that. But none of that gets translated down to the people that we got this data from, right? So I think because of that sort of gap in terms of how is this benefiting the community, there's this perception of, you know, zero respect for research. But I think if, if you can translate what you're doing and make it available to the people at the lowest level that you're dealing with, that you're interacting with, the populations you're getting this data from, there is a great deal of respect and value for what you're doing. I mean, that's my take on this. Wow, if Dr. Sabi wants to add to that, but I'm gonna throw a question at him and you know, catch him on the wrong foot. How do we, how can we get more younger people interested in academic research? How do we get people to do that? You know, uh, there's another word for research these days, which is called Google. That's another word for quote unquote research. How do we get young minds to get excited by research? How do you do that? Everybody wants to be a doctor or an MBA or a professor. Uh, Dr. Sabi, what are your thoughts on that? I think research is different from search. Google is a search engine. So I think uh, I can also answer your earlier question. And the answer to this particular question is also interrelated with your prior question. I think we as a society do value knowledge and we do value learning. The schoolmaster in the village is a respected figure in a village. And our teachers are respected generally by the population at large. Now, researchers and scientists are not well known in the society and there is where the problem lies. The problem is scientific dissemination. How do we disseminate our research and science to the population at large? If we do research and write a research article or make an invention and if it just remains in a fancy notebook or in a fancy international journal, which no one reads, it's not going to be of much use unless you can tell the story to others. And you tell the stories in a non-scientific language, which the laity can understand. I think this aspect of science journalism, or some people call it science communication, is a miss in our universities. In the School of Science and Engineering, we have for the first time made a science journalism wing, which can actually take these stories from our faculty, from our research uh, students, capsule them in a way that can be swallowed by the public. And then you make a film out of it, you make a documentary out of it, you write a blog out of it or a newspaper article out of it, and then post it on a web or on a newspaper so that the public at large can know what's happening, what research is, what are the different pitfalls of research, what are the opportunities and bounties research can offer. I think there's a problem with science communication. And if we are able to communicate our science in a language that is comprehensible to anyone walking in the streets, which is of course a local language, the vernacular or Urdu, that's where how our research stories should be shared. And I think that's what will raise the esteem and privilege of scientists and researchers in this country. And another good thing that has happened in our, uh, in our country which, and all the due credit goes to the HEC for that, is that for the first time in my life, I've seen that a, a grant giving organization, a donor organization, a funding organization such as the HEC and the Parks and Science Foundation and Ignite, they have risen up to the occasion. Now we can see these rapid research grants being offered by these organizations. So our faculty have also applied for these grants and now the academia in Pakistan is rising up to the occasion in, in a way and competing for these grants. So I think there's a lot of improvement and a lot of promise that I see for research in this country. You mentioned, Dr. Savi, you mentioned documentaries and films twice now. So uh, we want to see some of those documentaries or films that, that were made out of research. Uh, Dr. Eduardo, you know, there's a complete shutdown internationally and nobody knows when the world will come back to what we used to call normal. Well, nobody knows that. 
what's what's the impact of that um, on on research? One month, six months, eight months? We don't know when it's going to open. Um, how has your industry um, reacted to that? Well, um, there are ups and downs in that um, sense. In one hand, um, as I mentioned before, the collaborations, uh, specifically the international collaborations, even the local ones, um, are running online constantly uh, among researchers. Uh, that's the case of uh, Dr. Mubin and me, right? We are in the same city, but uh, barely we see each other face to face because we are in opposite sides of the same city. So we usually connect online. Um, similar thing with my colleagues in, in Europe and in America. But what I noticed could be a long-term impact, um, even when we try to compensate this, this negative um, aspect of this shutdown of traveling, is um, conferences. Uh, conferences, international conferences particularly, is something that is very worthy for us as researchers, despite the fact that most of the um, research supporting systems around the world don't like too much that we do traveling because of course that implies cost um, and that implies um, you know a logistics that um, not all the public servants um, agree to perform which is um, you know a little bit my experience in, 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 in other countries but it's extremely important uh, for researchers in terms that that encounter with your colleagues sparks creativity sparks collaboration sparks uh, knowledge sharing and it's very difficult to replicate that setup uh, online the human human in, uh, interaction is probably the top interaction that our humans aim along our lives right um we don't teach our babies to walk uh, watching youtube videos right we don't teach them uh swimming watching videos um, I, I hope so i'm not parent yet but i hope um parents don't try to teach kids to walk or to ride a bike using videos, but pretty much you got there and take the kid and, and move it. And in the same way, um, younger scientists, younger researchers um, have the opportunity to casually encounter senior researchers in conferences, in these symposiums and seminars. And that is an aspect of research that is quite important, quite, quite um, social and quite collaborative. Um, certainly some conferences have tried to do efforts, including the one that uh, Omar and I, we are part of um, the Human Agent Interaction Conference, which um, it, it was aiming to be held in Sydney at the end of the year, but now it will be run online. Um, the conference tried to set up the same uh, uh, kind of um, disposition online I, I have tried um, in, a, in a conference um, late March, uh, the Human Robot Interaction Conference, international conference. So they tried to set up uh, virtual rooms and they tried to set up the videos and presentations and so on. But that cannot substitute the, the, the human encounters. That is one of the downsides that I see about this short town of, of traveling. Certainly, um, with my limited. Um, experience and so on, I, I, I noticed that the travel will be restricted for quite long um, compared with the, with the local interaction, with the um, closest interactions between individuals. Um, co um, companies are, are struggling a lot, so come back to the normality will be quite hard for them. It will take longer than the lockdown finishes. So once that they put on air these planes, um, the associated costs will be not the same, definitely. All these um, 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 planes in the land not working require maintenance and require costs, so it's, it's a quite a financial burden for them. So the, the impact will be huge. And new collaborations definitely will be impact. Um, again, it's not that, um, it doesn't work like, oh, I write an email to somebody that I don't know and they will reply immediately and say, oh yeah, sure, let's do some collaboration. Doesn't work in that way. Uh, the encounter face-to-face -face is something that is critical, in my opinion, for performing research. Um, Dr. Umar, um, 
you know, the whole world, it seems to us, the outsiders, not the researchers, is, is geared towards finding a solution, you know, a vaccine, so to speak. Um, do you think that would change the future of doing research? And Dr. Eduardo mentioned collaboration. Do you think this experience, assuming, and hopefully, we will come out of this, let's say, you know, in the imminent future, would, would that change the culture of research? Or is it just a short-term thing? And, you know, researchers or academic researchers will just go back to the way things were the way they were, they were doing business? Um, I, yeah, to be honest, I think this is, we're, we're in for the long run here. I think this is something that will, we will have to, like, a, like I've said a couple of times before, we will have to adapt. And, and uh, essentially what this means is that, uh, yeah, we will have to basically persist with these sort of convention, these protocols and these conventions and these habits because uh, we will always be cautious now. And we will always be, uh, you know, circumspect, and we will always have at the back of our mind that we need to, you know, we need to take these things into account. Uh, you know, Eduard, uh, Eduardo mentioned about travel. Even if airlines start operating, there's no guarantee that universities let their staff travel uh, because of duty of care, because of insurances, and and so on and so forth. And that that applies to other companies. It doesn't just apply to universities. So. Um, so you, you may still be able to travel on, on, let's say, a personal level, but not on, on, on a business uh, trip. Um, I mean, I, I guess, yeah, this is something that is very clear that w because of the impact the whole situation has had, uh, we, we, this is something that, at least from my personal point of view, this is something that will not, we will not go, it will be very hard and it will take very time to go back to the world as we knew it. Um, and, and there was just one other thing I wanted to add about uh, the dissemination of research. Uh, um, so this is something, again, that's been discussed a lot in, in at least in my university. Uh, and it goes back to the impact of research. You know, so how do we propagate our research to the uh, wider community? And for this, what, what we've been encouraged to do is interact with the media. And because the media is sort of the main one of the main channels through which we can, uh, you know, disseminate our research. And we've been encouraged to interact with the media, uh, publish articles in technical magazines, in, in, in the conversation. So I'd, I'd recommend uh, uh, all the listeners in Pakistan who would, who would like to know more about research in a sort of a much softer way. The, the conversation provides a really good sort of outlet of, uh, you know, uh, of, um, of research, uh, you know, you know, re current state of the art research, and in, in a much more layman sort of a way. So it's uh, 800 words in an article, and it gives you a good good picture. Uh, me and Eduardo, we've written for the conversation before, and and that what that helps is that it gives a much more softer and simpler way of your describing your research to the to the community. Dr. Mariam, uh, would you take information from Pakistani media seriously? You know, like Dr. Mubin mentioned, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, here's, here's my slightly more serious question. What is it that the research community now needs to do? Anything that they need to, you know, uh, realign or change? One thing you had mentioned was the gap between, you know, once the research was done and published, you know, the subjects, if I may, didn't get the benefit. Anything that the research community now needs to change? A couple of things, but before I get into that, I will I will like to say that, you know, in all the time that I've worked with communities in Pakistan, a lot of it has been with youth, a lot of them have been with elderly people. I will say that, you know, I feel like Pakistani youth are already researchers. I think when there is a lack of resources, you will, I mean, the sort of hacks I've seen, I've been blown away, the sort of creative thinking I've seen uh, with, you know, with, with cycles and with rickshaws and in homes, they wanted the internet or the, the cable, the sort of hacks I've seen, I think they're already there. I don't think they call it formally research, but I think that, you know, their way of divergent thinking is so far beyond what I do because I've been sort of, um, I've been trained to think a certain way and they haven't. So it's all the unknown and everything's a possibility. So I think like the Pakistani youth is sort of already there. They just don't formally call it research. Um, as far as what the, the sort of the research community, I think one of the things that we really need to do is that we need to, this is a good time because everybody, the, you know, the, the funding organizations, the universities, everybody's being as flexible as possible. We're all together trying to figure out what to make of this, where we go from here. You know, as Dr. Um, Mubin mentioned earlier, 
The researchers are collaborating, you know, peer review has taken sort of a backseat and publications are coming out. And so this is a really good time to start thinking about what you want your research to look like in the long run. Because right now you have the flexibility to sort of change the direction of some of the grants that you have. You have the flexibility to change uh, the sort of areas you work in to see how they would fit in this new world order. And I think so many, I mean, and it's a, it's a strange thing to say in these times, just because of the, the just the horrifying um, figures and numbers we're seeing in terms of people infected and the kind of lives uh, they have at this point. But I think there's great opportunity as well that's now presenting itself. And as Dr. Anver mentioned, we are now truly in the great unknown, right? So as researchers, all the support structures that we had, all these boxes that we were working in, all these ideas of what we had of how things were and how things should be and what the future looked like, that's all been ripped away. And so we have a clean slate and it's like the great unknown in terms of how do you develop technologies for, for um, health? How do you develop technologies for online learning? We've never really focused on online learning as something that we, we, you know, that was essential, right? We've never really looked at, I would go as far as to say that I don't think we've ever looked at the internet and technology as essential, as an essential right, right? It is the right that I have, just like the right to health and well-being, right? So I think now the, the research community really needs to shift its focus and start thinking about technology as an essential right that everybody should have. And then from there, start thinking about how do you, so within the Pakistani context, for example, we've already started realigning our research and started thinking about how do we get everybody online? And once they're online, how do we impart to them the digital skills they need to make that useful, right? So I've you know, had these conversations with Uber drivers who are no longer making money anymore. And they're looking to fund um, the purchase of a laptop because they want to go online and they want to make money online. Now, there, there are no tools that will allow them to do this in a seamless way, right? How do we do that? So I think this is, there's great opportunity for the research community to sort of start realigning what they work on and have real impact. Uh, Dr. Eduardo, you want to add to that? Yes, yes. Um, I, I, I was just want to comment in support of, of the claim of um, uh, Dr. Mustafa in terms that um, this is also a great opportunity for um, uh, move to the education mode, right? Like uh, when you have a crisis and your income is threat, um, the, the approach of the Uber drivers make totally sense, right? Um, people will not allow themselves to die of starvation. It's just not a natural human condition. We will look after the means um, uh, to find our, our, our way of living. Um, on the other hand, I would like to comment about um, some of the most relevant innovations, creations, discoveries in the humankind have been done in isolation um, conditions. And um, I reckon it's, it's a good time also for academics to reflect um, in what we do and try to uh, summarize overall what happened in our disciplines. For instance, um, one way to go as, as uh, Omar and Mariam mentioned is try to find opportunities in funding for COVID projects and, and, and technologies for COVID and so on. Uh, but, but for instance, something that I'm doing now, it's doing the opposite because I know a lot of people is going for this funding. What I'm doing now is try to reflect in what it has been done in human robot interaction in the past and try to do this kind of meta reviews and more theoretical studies because I reckon, because we are very busy doing our current research, we don't have time to reflect on these kind of things until we are more senior. And maybe now is the time for me to be isolated and read tons of papers about, oh, what we have done in these 20 years in this specific area. So let's write about it and let's try to finally move all this knowledge towards the textbooks of the kids, which is another way to, to have an impact in, in, this, in this situation. Dr. Sabi, we have a, a, a very worried friend. Her name is Hira Farid. And she, she's saying that all the research is now geared towards finding a solution or a vaccine for COVID-19. What about the other diseases? Uh, uh, you know, it may not be your field, but how would you respond to a young person who's nervous about, you know, 
resources being diverted to one particular people so i think hira shouldn't worry too much about it <laughs> because covid is one of many i think uh, covid is another respiratory disease of viral origin and in fact responding to covid highlights and reveals that scientific research academic research the way we discover vaccines way the way we invent vaccines the way we discover drugs and the process by which these drugs are regulated and finally approved by regulatory authorities and then tested in the clinic all of this is an ecosystem it's a milieu that has to develop and whenever a calamity of this nature and form uh, occurs in a, in a developing world it's actually an opportunity because the national science agencies must then respond to it and it highlights the importance of a scientific thinking and a scientific process that goes into addressing these problems so even though we may be directly targeting covid there are many other things that will come as a blessing in disguise you will have a health informatics system you will have greater statistics available for your diseases in the country you will have a better hospital management system the process for responding to natural health calamities of this kind is going to be experimented upon so it's not just covid that we are tackling with it's the entire health makeup of this country that is being jostled around and we're trying to respond to it okay so hira you know that's your answer i don't know about hira but i am i am satisfied and i am not too worried i'm worried but not not too worried uh dr uh, umar mubeen uh dr sabi mentioned two words in the same sentence calamity and opportunity um what for researchers or academic researchers what has been the biggest benefit of the the covid-19 uh, crisis has there been any takeaways from this for now yeah so i think we've been a bit uh, it's been mostly a, a bit of a negative tone that we've had we've talked a lot about a lot of the challenges that we've faced uh, but i think uh, dr sabi mentioned a few different aspects related to you know how we we are you know understanding different research processes how the research that's been done on covid would help uh you know the research on other viruses and other respiratory viruses uh and it will essentially it will help with uh uh you know you know with uh, coming up with uh, different ways of tackling these sort of pandemics uh but i think the key thing that i'd really like to pick up on is something that we've been trying as well with our with my students specifically is the availability of data around covid-19 so what we have is we have these data repositories we have these portals we have these dashboards we have visualizations all related to covid-19 essentially what it means is that you have re real time live data that you can use for your analysis for your study for your projections for your modeling which allows uh, you know you know scientists or researchers mathematicians data scientists and so on to be able to understand how the 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 virus is spreading and also to come up with the projections so what would happen uh uh say in uh, um you know in in how would the you know when would the sort of the curve flatten uh, and, and so on and so forth so these this sharing of data and this these repositories uh, john hopkins dashboard is the most common one they they are very accessible you can write programs which can call these repositories and you can extract the data in real time um i think this is sort of the biggest for me it's sort of the biggest takeaway or the biggest benefit in my opinion dr mariam dr umar thinks uh, you know data uh, sharing of data has been the biggest benefit for now um, what are your thoughts on what what is the biggest takeaway or benefit of this crisis so i am i'm a technologist and i look at everything through you know technology utopian glasses right so i think one of the biggest benefits has been that there is now this understanding because everybody is sort of in the same boat right well sort of right somebody has a has a motor boat and somebody has a robot and somebody does have oars but we're sort of in the same vicinity and in the same space right which means that now you know companies and researchers and governments everybody is realizing the importance of of uh, access for everybody right 
So these inequities that have existed in terms of access to technology, access to education, access to healthcare, now they are in very stark contrast, right? And so now there's a scramble to try and get everybody on board to try and, you know, even companies are now focused on um, how do you develop digital tools that include everybody? How do you develop learning tools that include everybody? How do you develop health related tools that target low income, low literate populations, right? And to me, that's fantastic, right? Like kicking and screaming, we're all being dragged into this sort of digital age and digital space. Um, and we are now really thinking not in terms of, so particularly the developing country model has been, you take a Western technology like YouTube, Facebook, WhatsApp, you import it, and then you try and sort of deploy it within local context, right? This is a really terrible way of doing it because the local context is different, right? The people are different, right? So the technologies in Pakistan that have worked really well has been WhatsApp, has been YouTube, because they are, WhatsApp allows you to um, communicate on voice, right? It's not a text-based system. It allows you to leave voice messages. Now we're really thinking about, okay, so if we have to develop these online tools, so if companies need to make money, they need to go online, they need to get people online, now, right? And they need to get people online using these tools. So now all of these sort of inequities have come into light. I've seen so many articles in the last month talking about inequities, even among women, right? Gender inequities, the sort of role women, you know, the article I was reading a couple of days ago that talked about the sort of uh, insanely huge role that is placed on female researchers compared to male researchers, just because the responsibility of care is more on them. All of these things have now come out of our closets and they're out in the open and we can now start to open them. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we're out of time and as a sense of propriety, the lady should have the last word. Uh, thank you, Dr. Eduardo. Thank you, Dr. Umar. Thank you, Dr. Mariam. And thank you, Dr. Sabi. It was a pleasure. Most, most enlightening uh, conversation. And those of you who are watching, please stay safe and please stay indoors and look after yourself. Thank you and khuda hafiz.